we, we have an OS problem, so I'm going to have to show it in this view. Um, the thing about this talk that I want to emphasize is a lot of the work I'm going to show here is experimental, both in the artistic and the scientific. But it's going to give you an overview of what's coming down the pike in the next 10 years for research and um, both covert and overt about the brain. And a lot of people aren't aware of this, not because it's hidden, but because it's not their focus. So I'm going to merge both the art world and the science world and the surveillance world in this. And I'm going to finish, if there's enough time, with a one minute um, clip of the world's first brain opera that I just premiered in Hong Kong in which a performer launched video, a sonic environment, and a libretto just with their brain waves interacting with the audience live time as their brain waves were on view. Um, so I'll show you that too. Okay. So <clears throat> The question is, is the brain the next hackable driver? And I'm sorry about this view, but it's the one I have to use. And the answer is, yes, it is. Um, most people think of this as uh, that kind of EEG setup. But what's happened now is we've gotten BCIs, brain computer interfaces. And they basically take the signals from your brain, um, and you can control different things with them, prosthetic limbs, so on and so forth. That's the medical uses of them. Now there are consumer grade BCIs and some of them are open source, some of them are not, and they range in price from uh, a little over $100 to $1,000. And you can buy them on the open market. Most people think of brain-computer interfaces as M uh, fMRIs also. You know, you go in, you get an F MRI. And I like to show this one because it shows the brain effect and differences between musicians and non-musicians, that there are differences. So that's what most people think of. However, BCIs began in the 1970s. And right at the start, DARPA was involved with BCIs right from the get-go. Um, and they started at UCLA. Um, and then there was early work mostly done on monkeys, rats, and so on and so forth. And we know that um, that led to other things. So I'm going to give you a five-second crash course in how an EEG works. So your brain puts out electrical signals, which is basically the difference in ionic charge with sodium and potassium. And if you can see in this graphic, the electrode uh, translates the signal or the charge. Um, how does the brain turn thoughts into action? Well, your neurons get a charge, they go to the next one. And it works for about 250th of a second. I'm not going into the science of it because that's not what this is about. Um, and I'm going fast because I have a lot of things to show you. Um, the skull in the EEG or an external EEG as opposed to an internal G EEG blocks a lot of the signals that come into your brain and the signal has to be smoothed through an algorithm and the algorithms are varied and have different degrees of efficacy. Um, there's more machine learning now and algorithms. This is what's known as the basic 1020 system. And that's what you saw that one of the first visuals with lots of lines coming out of the head. That was a 1020 system that's used in most medical labs. However, this is really how it works. Uh, it's, uh, and a lot of you will love this because it's about signal acquisition. You digitize the signal, you process it, you translate it, you give it a command, and thus you have the BCI application. And I think um, that's pretty true of a lot of signal processing. But in this case, what you get is you get things like um, you can change it, and you can turn it into lights or colors or video or music or tactile 
or thermal or in, in the future, scent or odors or this kind of thing, all from your brain. It's, you can really do that. Um, the thing is what kind of signal you're measuring is very important. Now, in terms of the actual physiology of your brain, you have your brain, your skull, the skin. There's invasive and non-invasive types of information. And as you know, it becomes digitized just into zeros and ones. But this is really good for people who want to, there are people who can now control wheelchairs and prosthetic limbs with this by thinking that they want to do something. And there's been a lot of work, especially with people with ALS um, or Lou Gehrig's disease, who um, at this point can't even blink their eyes, yet they can think a thought and something will happen. Wow. However, but in the art world, which I'm part of, uh, BCIs go way back. They go back w up to 1965, and I'm gonna show you a very short clip of Alvin Lussier's 1965 Music for Solo Performer, um, in which it was the first brainwave piece with an electrode that he attached to his scalp and he made drums play. Um, and this was before there were really uh, BCIs for the most part. So let's just see if we get sound. And I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna let you see him, and then I'm gonna fast forward it. <coughs> so that's Alvin Lussier with his little brain band, and he looks he's concentrating. And I'm gonna fast forward this because there's a lot of setup. They show everything, and he also has something on his hand as well. This is the piece. This is from 1965 again. And here you should, is our audio working? I'm not getting an audio signal. Can someone come up here? The audio has been disabled. Are there any tech people here? <laughs> <laughs> no, well they, dis -auto they disabled my audio. Okay, good, because they disabled my audio when they set me up and I don't know what they did. I know, but I would like the person who set it up to, you know, come and fix it. Okay, they're coming. All right. Um, I'm going to... Oh, okay, you're going to come up and... Can you fix my audio, please? Are you getting it on the live stream? Yeah, please give me my audio back. Yeah, there is audio, I did say. <laughs> oh, you didn't plug it in, huh? Okay, we have lots of plugs up here, so I wasn't, I'm not concentrating. Bring it up on the console. Okay, because look, I'm not getting, oh, there we go. And let's hear the sound. Thank you. So uh, Alvin Lussier's brain waves are giving out vibrations which go into speakers here. We're, we're still not getting sound, although I'm on full sound. All right. It's good we're doing it on this piece because there's other pieces I need to show you. Okay. Yeah, well, it's a sound. I don't know if it's the correct sound. Let's hear. Yeah, it's the correct sound. You hear this? This is his brainwaves in 1965. Okay. Okay, I just wanted you to hear that because um, now we have that. In 1973, John Cage began using brainwave signals also with Nam June Pike. I'm just trying to give you a sense of how far back this goes in the art world. David Ro Rosenboom um, just premiered a piece at the Whitney last year in which he worked with four brains and produced a whole concert with that. So um, this was from 1972, his diagram. And what you can see is it's a system for four brains 
and they go into and make sound. And he realized this uh, last year at the new Whitney um, in the meat market. So now I want to switch back to DARPA. In 1973, the first term brain-computer interface was published um, by a scientist, uh, Videl. Um, and that was also partially funded by DARPA. Um, what happened after that is a man named Lawrence Farwell uh, really jumped on it in the late 1980s. And he started making um, something called the P300 Mimer signal, which is a signal uh, in your brain of recognition. And what that means is in when you recognize something, like you see your dog or something, your brain spikes with recognition, and there's no way you can avoid that. It's, automa it's, on on an it's automatic, and it takes a one three hundredth of a second, which is why it's called a Mimer response. And that's something the FBI, the CIA, the Navy, and everyone else has been involved with, with um, Farwell since it first began. So what I'm trying to do with this uh, presentation is show you both the art world and DARPA were sort of running neck and neck with working with BCIs, although they were unbeknownst to each other. Um, Farwell is still very active, and you can Google him. He has huge contracts out for the P300 signal, and that signal has already been tested in side channel attacks for neurogaming, which I will talk about a little later. Um, the brain produces basically four types of brain waves, delta, theta, alpha, and beta. <coughs> They have different frequencies, and most people know alpha, which is uh, meditation, and beta, which is interest. Uh, delta and theta are more about sleep or very deep concentration. I bet both of you are either in beta or not in beta right now, which means interest or non-interest. <laughs> Uh, again, this is a little more explanation about the frequency ranges of these signals. And that's a lot of what the Hertz levels is a lot of what these commercial BCIs pick up. There's Open BCI, which is the open source version, and it's in development. It keeps being development where you can read things. Uh, that's the early prototype of the headset. That's the early board. They've uh, updated it since then. It's Bluetooth enabled. You can buy one. You can use it on your own brain. It's pretty raw stuff. It doesn't have a lot of interpretation at this point. Uh, it's both dry point and paste, depending what version you get. Commercial versions that you can buy are the NeuroSky, which is the entry level one that gets alpha and beta. It's a little over $100. The Muse headset, which is very good for meditation and is a little easier to use. The Emotive, uh, which I used for my brain opera and has 14 points and is a little more robust. It's also a little more expensive. And it takes eight seconds to calibrate specific contours and folds of any individual brain. And the Emotive can do that. Um, so I want to show you one or two things that have been done with the emotive uh, as a segue before we get into the heavy surveillance stuff. Yehudi Duenas, who's an artist, created the Ascent, which is basically you strap on a harness. It premiered in Sunset Park four years ago. And with your own concentration, you lift up in the harness. And if you lose concentration, you lower. But if you keep concentration, you lift up 30 feet and uh, bells go off and, st and confetti comes down. So it's sort of like a game, and I'm gonna show you a quick uh, one minute clip of that. This was in Sunset Park.
Okay, so Yehudi now wants to make this into a sort of traveling road show in which eight, between eight and 24 people are meditating and levitating at the same time. So it kind of looks like something out of a sci-fi movie where the spirits are ascending to heaven, and that's his drawings about it. So that shows you a little bit of, you know, the fun part of it. Um, also, there was an installation in Toronto called My Virtual Dream with more than 500 adults wearing Muse wireless headsets, and they played a collective um, neurofeedback computer game, and that was in 2013. That was in a dome. There's also the Cyborg Foundation, um, some of you may or may not know who Neil Harbison is. He wears, uh, he was born without being able to see color, so he wears a device outside his head where he picks up 360 uh, types of colors and turns them into sound waves inside his brain. Yeah, and um, here he, you can see how he makes the um, visual to the, um, chromatic, the sounds, and he, at first he used to do things like meet celebrities and make pictures of them, how they sound. This is him also showing the color wheel of the sound, and that's Moon Rebus, also part of the Cyborg Foundation. And they're showing, the, uh, you can see at the top it's a sound wave, and at the bottom it's color. And that's sort of what happens to the brain. So. Um, what Neil did is he did the world's first skull transmitted painting. Yeah, that's right, a skull transmitted painting in which a painting was done in Times Square, sent via Skype um, into a room, and what happened is it was uploaded into his brain, and I'm gonna show you a little bit of that very quickly. I think you'll so basically, we feel that all these senses that we are developing with the Cyber Foundation are very, very natural because uh, they're related to senses that already exist. In my having an antenna makes me feel closer to insects that already have antennas. Also, hearing through bone conduction makes me feel closer to uh, dolphins that also hear through bone conduction. And perceiving infrared and ultraviolet makes me feel closer to insects that also perceive these colors. The second performance will be uh, something we've never done before, it, which is uh, I'll be connected to a, a white canvas that is now in Times Square. Then passerbys will paint different colored lines on the on the canvas, and then this will be connected to my head, because uh, since a couple of years ago, I have internet connection to my head, so I can now receive colors from other uh, parts of the world. So uh, there's like now five different people in the world that have connection that can send colors from different continents. So now I'm not only relying on the colors that I have in front, I can also sense colors that are way far away from here. So we're gonna test creating exactly the same painting at the same time, one in Times Square, one here. We'll be connecting through Skype so you can see the process live. Uh, in there and I'll be here facing the other way so I can sense and paint exactly the same painting. It might not work, but uh, yeah, as we said, it's experimental. We've never tried it before. Uh, they'll be picking up. They have been given specific instructions, so they have to paint the color line and then I'll be receiving the, the color line in my head and then I'll be painting exactly the same color line. So it, it, it will be seven people that will pick up any color and then we'll be doing the lines, and it should be the same. So that was in Times Square, and it was projected on a wall. This is a video image. And they would zoom in to, like, the color green. And he, Neil, would um, hear the sine wave of the color green coming into his head, and then he would match the sine wave of the color green to the tube of paint without ever seeing it. He would just hear it through the internet hookup in his head. So what he's doing is he's putting in his eyeboard to hear the sine waves on the different colors that he's experiencing. So this is all done wirelessly. And as you can see, he never turns around. That's what's going on in Times Square, and then you can see how it's being reflected on his.
the world's first skull transmission painting. He still can't see the colours there. Um, so what's actually going to happen now is the canvas is going to come to to the red door from Times Square. It's on its way, um, and we'll be able to actually compare them side by side. Uh, I had slow transmission. So he was I, picking I up a lot of infrared in Times uh, Square so I, because I, he I can also pick up infrared. So he yeah. messed it's orange and red a little bit in this so, uh, picture. <laughs> somewhere else in the world um, someone could be creating a painting and and it's going straight to your your brain and and you're you're like in, in synergy and in one with it this is Anita Marinta who, who was the the director of our Times Square operation all right so, um, so one has more orange and more red well, just ignore the same <laughs> <laughs> okay so I just wanted you to see that um, because that's the fun stuff. That's the art stuff, right? So now we're going to get a little more serious. And remember, uh, what was it, Hope with uh, Ed Snowden and Daniel Ellsberg? <laughs> well, we all know that if you think what's been done with network technology has been um, something, way do you see what's coming with the brain? So uh, most governments in the world right now have 10-year or more brain initiatives to map every neuron in the human brain. That includes the US government, the European Union, the Australian government, the Japanese government, the Israeli government, the Canadian government, and a little bit the Chinese government. Uh, probably the amounts with all those governments is in the trillions of dollars. In terms of the United States government, there's the Obama Brain Initiative, and if you follow the money, DARPA is getting half the money for that. The National Institute of Health is getting a quarter of it, and the National Science Foundation is getting the rest. And there's so much money that DARPA just went and combined a lot of other agencies and created a new agency, or merged agency, I would say. Um, and I'll show you that in a minute, but they have now a special section of DARPA called the Biological Technologies Office. Just, and they're very user friendly now. They want you to reach out and touch somebody. Uh, they solicit proposals. So here it's like they, they, they send themselves, says, hi, we want to give you opportunities and we want to crowdsource and we want to love you and it's very, um, shocking how out there they are with it and you can go on the site and look. Um, here is IARPA and that's the new wing that came out not just of DARPA of many different agencies. It's called the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity and you can go on their site and you can see just how brain specific it is. If you look, it says IARPA joins White House Brain Initiative. They've got press releases. They've got, you know, outreach. They want to go into schools. They want to have kids hack the brain. I mean, they, they're really out there with it, which is both wonderful and a little strange. Here they have seedling information. Submit your ideas to us. Here's what we um, seeded before, you know, and, and you can, all of you, can, if you're interested, can go on and see what they're looking at. Now, why I find this particularly strange is um, because I want to show you just the state of brain fingerprinting at this moment. Fingerprinting your brain. Now that you've been practicing this more, Mavi, can you see it when it starts to entrain? Brain print is a technique for identifying people with their brain activity. And can you just adjust him a little side to side? We record people's brain activity while they look at a series of images that are designed to elicit very unique responses from person to person. So you might see a picture of a sushi and a picture of a pizza and a picture of Adam Sandler and a picture of Kim Kardashian and the word conundrum and a whole bunch of things rapidly flashing at you. Take a reading, 25. Where did you put it? Right there. 
So when you take hundreds of those, where every person is going to feel differently about each individual one, then you can be really accurate in identifying which person it was that looked at them just from their brain activity. The key idea of brain printing is we want to establish a new biometric. The concept of biometric, you, you may be more familiar with like a fingerprint, iris recognition, face recognition. Those biometrics, they are good, they are very accurate in identifying individuals, but they have several key limitations. Look at that. Okay. Using EEG or brain activity as a way of biometrics, you know, has been proposed before. But the difference is previously people more focused on active thinking. We are focusing on the more challenging but more unique non-volitional intuitive brain response. Non-volitional also is that P300. We want signal. to identify and recognize the individual person based on their inside thinking. Okay, inside <laughs> brain activity that is non-visible. That means even the user cannot be aware of that. My collaboration with Zheng Peng Jin is kind of unique because he's an engineer and I'm a psychologist and most of the past attempts at brain biometrics have been made just by engineers. And that collaboration has been really fruitful as it crosses cybersecurity and biometrics and cognitive neuroscience and psychology. And I think it's why our brain print protocol is more accurate and faster than any of the existing protocols. You can do that in the brain too. My graduate student Maria Ruiz Blondet has shown that we can achieve 100% identification accuracy and that was a huge breakthrough. 100 this idea accuracy. is based on the scientific rationale, okay, everyone is supposed to have the unique memory and knowledge. We're unique, our brains are unique, our thoughts are unique, our feelings are unique. It's really like quantifiable, you are not the same as any other person. We definitely see the applications of brain print as being use for access to very high security locations like the Pentagon. So we think the brain print will definitely represent the very promising next generation biometrics. Have a seat, young research assistant. Okay, so next generation biometrics, 100% accurate, your brain print. Think about the implications of that, okay? So there's more. <laughs> That's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, if you look at this picture, there's a picture of a newscaster's face, and there is a clip reconstructed from different MRI parts of the brain, which is now called the semantic brain lighting up. This has also been used for dr dream reconstruction, mostly in Japan. And I'm going to show you just a little bit of what that's about. Now, if you look at this, and then the next uh, slide will explain this more, this is a map of what's called the semantic brain. What research is finding out is your brain is not right and left, but that it's um, very coded for specific things. And I'm going to let this explain it much better than I can. This is um, the actual researcher. Hi, my name is Alex Huth. And I'm going to tell you about a study I did here at UC Berkeley, along with Shinji Nishimoto, and Vu, and Jack Gallant. When you look around the world, your brain is busily recognizing and categorizing everything that you see. So we presume that different categories of things are represented differently in the brain. But that doesn't mean that they're represented in completely different ways. Take cars and motorcycles, for example. They share a lot of features. They both have wheels, they both have headlights, they both go on roads. They fulfill pretty much the same functions. So you might think that they're represented pretty similarly in the brain. But how can we extend this idea to all the thousands of categories that we can see? One way would be to use a semantic space, where nearby categories are semantically similar, but distant categories are semantically very different. So what does the brain semantic space look like? Which of the thousands of categories that we can see are represented similarly in the brain and which aren't? To answer these questions, we put five human subjects in an MRI machine and recorded their brain activity while we showed them two hours of movie trailers, where we had labeled all the objects and actions that appeared during each second of the movies. Now, functional MRI measures blood flow in little rectangular areas called voxels. Our voxels are about two by two by four millimeters, and it takes about 30,000 of them to cover the entire cortex. So our next step was to determine how each category of object and action affected the blood flow in each voxel. We did this using regularized regression analysis. What we're left with is a model that tells us how each of the 30,000 voxels responds to each of the 1,705 categories in the movies. 
Then we used principal components analysis, or PCA, to recover a semantic space from each subject's brain. PCA gives us a low dimensional space where categories that are represented similarly in the brain are close together, but categories that are represented very differently tend to be far apart. Interestingly, we found that the first four dimensions seem to be shared across our subjects. Now, of course, our true shared semantic space has more than four dimensions, but we're limited here by uh, the size of our stimulus set and the resolution of fMRI. So what do the shared semantic dimensions look like? We're going to visualize them here using a graphical structure drawn from WordNet, which is a semantic taxonomy so your brain painstakingly hand-constructed by a team of linguists. In locations in, in the cortex. Each category is shown as a node, and the links between categories show is a relationships, like an athlete is a human. And verb categories, like communication verbs linked, and movement you verbs, are shown as separate trees. Here we're showing the first shared semantic dimension. It seems to distinguish things that move, like people, animals, and vehicles, from things that don't, like buildings in the sky. This is not really surprising, since we know that bright, fast things just tend to elicit more activity in visual cortex. The next three dimensions distinguish categories associated with people, categories associated with civilization, and biological categories. So your brain is more But instead of looking at each dimension think. separately, we can visualize all three at the same time. Now we've colored each node to show where it lies in each dimension. The red component of the color is set by the second dimension, the green component is set by the third, and the blue component is set by the fourth. So for example, the category that's high on the second and third dimensions but low on the fourth, so like a mammal. So if you see a mammal and it lights up, that this can be detected in the fMRI and the it can begin to be reconstructed, colors. which is what they did. Here we see that people and communication verbs are represented similarly, and animals are also not so different. Vehicles and buildings and movement verbs are also pretty similar to each other, but different from people and animals. This movie is showing the same data, but we've also positioned each node according to where it lies on the second, third, and fourth dimensions. So now we have a pretty good idea of what the brain's semantic space looks like. We can use the semantic space to map out how different categories are represented in different parts of the brain. The first step is to take a high-resolution anatomical MRI of each subject's brain. Then we use this image to construct a 3D model of the cortical surface. Then we flattened out the cortical surface so that we can see the entire cortex at the same time. Now we can color in each voxel according to what part of the semantic space it's selected for. These colors are the same that we saw earlier. Green is for humans, yellow is for other animals, pink and violet are for vehicles, and, and dark blue is for buildings. And this can be used for your dreams also. And it what we see is a really complex pattern of semantic selectivity labs, throughout higher visual right cortex. Now. These patterns are consistent with the well-known semantically selective brain areas, like the fusiform face area and parahippocampal place area. But we also see semantic selectivity in much of the surrounding cortex. Now, if you find this as exciting as I do, <laughs> you'll be itching to play with this data yourself. Well, you're in luck. We've made an online viewer where you can see the flattened and 3D brain maps. You can click on each voxel to see exactly which categories it represents. And you can click on each category to see exactly how it's represented across the cortex. This viewer is available now at gallantlab.org slash semantic movies. So that's it. If you want to learn more, read the paper at Neuron, and thanks for listening. Okay, so what this basically means is that your brain is organized um, it, into categories that at this point through an fMRI, but at another point through other means, can be tracked. So if you're, if you're someone and you're dreaming and you're in a situation where it can be tracked, uh, people can tell what you're dreaming uh, at this point very vaguely. Um, it's going to take a lot more research. Or if you're thinking of something or being shown something, you cannot fake that you recognize it or don't recognize it. So that's the state. And now there's something called optogenetics in which false memories can be implanted and they are being implanted into mice. Optogenetics is a science of light, and it's a very recent science. It only came out in 2011. And basically how it works is it takes light-sensitive protein from algae, puts it into DNA in specific neurons in the brain, and transplants it. Right now, it turns on and off with special light that's blue turns it on and red turns it off. So what that means is you could have a mouse, and you could have a happy mouse, uh, and then you shock it 
in a, and it's in a box and you take it out of the bo and you optogenetically manipulate it and you take it out of the box and put it in a, in a grassy field and the mouse is running around in the grassy field and you turn the blue light on it and the mouse goes into shock because it thinks it's back in the box getting the shock but actually nothing's happening it's running around in the grassy field so a false memory has been implanted into the mouse and been turned on this is in an experimental stage right now. It takes a lot of um, genetic manipulation, but it works. The other thing that's going on is DARPA is uh, developing something called the cortical modem. And the cortical modem will be the size of a nickel, and it will be implanted right into your brain, giving you images directly into the brain with no other interface. Right now it's being used in zebrafish because again it's another genetic situation. It's being used because they think that'll be a good way for soldiers to communicate from just brain to brain and that's why it's being developed. Now I found out about this and DARPA had a conference in New York last year and they wanted people to reach out and do something so I thought okay I'll reach out and do something so I wrote to them. I said, hi, DARPA, I want to come to your conference. And they were like, yeah, sure, we'll, and here's the email I got. And they said, I will forward your email. Never heard from them again. Okay, but I did reach out just like they wanted you to, right? I said, I want to see this cortical modem. Uh-uh, no way, right? Okay, so then there's also cloud brain so now your brain data is being uploaded to the cloud did you know that not your brain data but brain data and there'll be more and more of this especially as neurogaming goes on so uh what is that about there's um there was the experimental tech conference and expo they're around they happen every year now and that's where you get uh, the people who are working on cloud brain and brain information in the cloud and the people who are designing the systems and I'm not going to go into all the systems that exist but I will say that some are already in the startup phase and are being well funded by venture capital so that's you can check out neurogaming conferences they exist they're usually on the west coast i think we're going into our third or fourth year of neurogaming conferences and that means your da brain data is stored in the cloud or can be and probably will be especially for gaming so that leads me to the final part of what i came here to talk about which is my own uh brain opera and um, whoops Consciousness is misspelled, sorry about that. Anyway, um, is there a place in human consciousness where surveillance cannot go? And I'm gonna show you a very uh, short excerpt from this in which the main actor um, had four emotions register which were uh, interest, excitement, meditation, and frustration. And these four emotions launched data banks of, of images that were, and sounds and words that were around those four emotions in front of a live audience in a 360 degree theater um, as she interacted. And I'm putting together the video, but I have a one minute clip I can show you right here very quickly. And I'll try and talk a little bit about what's going on. And you'll see bubbles, and the bubbles are different colors of brain states. Like you see those uh, pink bubbles? Those pink bubbles are excitement. Uh, yellow is interest. I colored them blue. Uh, turquoise is meditation, and red is frustration. So here. I had to be very careful. I was hiding all time. So here, she's touching someone. Frustration is launching. That's the libretto. Sonic environment. We were betrayed. That's one right. by one. The life that I have is yours. Other members of the cell gave Noor up. Her code name was Madeline. Concentration camps. 
My father, my house will bless thee. Okay, so in that clip, um, I was talking to the performer, but the backstory, the back words like concentration camps, my house of blessing, that's the libretto and her brain was triggering that. Um, the images you were seeing, her brain were triggering all those images. The dots you were seeing, her brain was triggering all of that, depending on what was going on in the story. And this performance took about 20 minutes. No one can wear a headset much longer than that without um, having a pain in the brain. And so, to the best of my knowledge, it was the world's first brain opera. So where does that leave us in terms of what's going to happen? Well, there is one group that's taking responsibility for this. They're called uh, CERE-B, the Center for Responsible Brainwave Technologies, and there's their link. And they're beginning to put out publications about the ethics of brainwave technology and brainwave technology privacy guidelines. Let's hope people follow their um, instructions, but in, the, uh, in terms of governments that don't adhere to this, um, it's an open question. So that's basically my presentation. And now questions? think about that because a lot of this is still in a position for me to um, publish about it and I am publishing a lot about it in peer-reviewed journals so that's why I'm not uh, being too public about it yet that's why but this is all information that you can pretty much source or Google this is not great secrets here especially about DARPA and IARPA Yeah. Which, uh, which country's brain initiatives do you think are the most advanced? Um, I personally think that the United States is going full tilt for brain initiatives. And I think that there's a very public face to IARPA, and I think there's a very non-public face. And I can't penetrate it because I don't have security clearance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How far are we from technology rather than having a helmet? That the, um, the military is designing. Uh, how far are we fr from? Did I get this right? Wearing a helmet instead of a physical helmet. Well, basically, the military. That's a great question. Is designing those helmets, and they're designing those helmets already for soldiers to have direct brain-to-brain -brain communication. Um, which they feel will be much easier and much less open to misinterpretation. So that is in the design stage. You're you're right about that. Yeah. Uh, that is really in the future if you don't have to wear a helmet to read someone's brainwaves. But by the end of these 10-year initiatives by all these countries, I don't have an answer for that. It's the the research is going very quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a great book by the Pentagon's brain. Yeah, the Annie Jacobson's The Pentagon's Brain, which was just mentioned. I I reference that a lot in my written publications. Annie Jacobson just wrote a um, history of DARPA, which no one has ever done. And Annie mentions this initiative. And she mentions um, how terrified she is by this initiative because it, it's being run by the same people, uh, Boeing, Lockheed, uh, all of those people are now on the advisory board. So it's the people running it who sell the equipment to the military industrial complex. And it's a closed loop now. So that's why it's a little frightening. But um, Annie Jacobson's book is fantastic. The, 
the question is she had um, uh, something about soldiers uh, having more invasive brain computer interfaces. Um, I think that there will be, but it will be very covert and it will be very volunteer and it, we won't really know about it. That's the dark hole of DARPA IARPA. That's going to be classified. But yeah, I agree with her on that. All right. Yeah. Uh, how far uh, can it device be used from the head? Okay, th th that's a how far can a device be from the head? Well, e to capture brain waves. Well, are you talking about MRI or EEG brain waves? EEG is you mount it on your scale, skull, and it, at this point in an fMRI, you have to go into a big machine. Although I'm sure those things will be miniaturized. Yeah. Movies in your mind? Not quite, unless it's from Jack Gallant's lab. I think it is. Yes, I have. I have. Yeah, the, well, the, the thing that the question was about is Jack Gallant's lab in Berkeley, where the Alexander Huth part was from, um, has a lot of this research about the dreams and the semantic brain, and that's part of the semantic brain research. So you're right. I mean, it's just there's only so much you can include in a one-hour presentation, but thanks for that. Any, yeah? Um, are there similar tools like with the BCI for prototyping and for amateur brain hackers to get started? <laughs> OpenBCI is very feasible, but the thing is, um, right now it's raw data, and it uses, in order to interpret it, you have to really use something called MATLAB. It's not um, that user friendly for the average user at this point, um, although if you can write really good code, you can do stuff with it, I think. It's, it's more accurate, but it doesn't have smoothing algorithms, unlike the commercial grade p um, ones. So, yeah. Um, when they were showing the fMRI picture, um, yeah. it looked it sort of basically like a 2D view. The question was, the brain looked like a 2D view in the fMRI, and will the 3D view play in? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was just, that was just one video. Like I said, I could have spent a half hour just on the semantic brain. I'm just, you know, I'm throwing a lot of stuff out here very quickly because it's the HOPE conference, and I want to get a lot of information out fast. But, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's a question. Does the brain fingerprint change over time? Um, there's a whole critique of that called brain blobology by a neuroscientist called Sally Sattel who would, a who would ask that question. And that's a really great question, which researchers haven't caught up with yet. But you better believe in the next 10 years, they will ask those questions. So that's a great question that is yet to be answered. Any more questions? OK, that's it. Thanks so much. <laughs>